Uh, he's drunk, but if somebody wouldn't pick him up, he would be dead in some hours, you know? It's so cold now. Hoi, Aga. Aga. Hoes. Hoi. Ontegpallig, hoi, zo. Hoi. Sire. Maybe you help me help. to pick him up, you know? And if we could put him like in a warm place, yeah. because if you don't do it, he will lose. So, Yavara, Yavara, can you go? Where? Maybe put him in a shop. I don't know, but just put him on a warmer. So, Yavara. It's so if we're oh there's a police but they don't do either, you know, and they just Hoi Tegun Hantage to gear gift it spice tot eigen katze tegel and ayulte Police is not interested to help. Can we go here, huh? But if you can put him in the entrance of a flat or so, just to make sure he won't die. Oh. In this city, every day, or night and day, like uh, five or seven people die in Ulaanbaatar. Because, because they, they're drunk? they drunk, they fall down, they don't feel anything. And they free, it just takes a few hours when it's minus 30. I asked the police what to do because they said people are dying and he said yes I know so he said okay I'll take care of it so he's now checking him out trying to wake him up asking if he finds his way home I saw it while people being dead in the morning you know and nobody would do something it's really frustrating sometimes but this guy is okay I never regretted going to Mongolia and I never regretted living this life style. But one thing I said, God, you didn't tell me that it would change my whole heart. I'm not the one I used to be. Hanukkah lives in Ulaanbaatar, the capital city of Mongolia. Five years ago, Hanukkah left Amsterdam to work in Mongolia with the missions organization called Help International. In those five years, Ulaanbaatar became home for Hanukkah. But tomorrow, she's leaving the city, and it could be for a very long time. Jouw gierig tijd. Ik heb uh, gewee Marke Jork aan het in bij me bij wat. The journey will take at least 12 hours. Hanukkah will go to a remote village in the Henti province. The mission organization she works for has asked if she is willing to go there and establish a mission post. It could happen that God would say, hey, can you, could you please move to the countryside? Would you live in this village? When I see the people, it really touched my heart. And at the same time, I'm like, no, no, please, you know, don't tell me I have to live there, eat Mongol food only, uh, don't have other foreigners around. 
uh, no washing machine, no hot showers, you know, these little things. And you can say, oh, it's not important, but I like them, you know. So I said, I have my house shoes in the back, so was ich zurück bin, bin zu hoch. I think going to the countryside for me, just saying, okay, I would go for a year or two years. I don't know if it would happen, but it would be just the same thing almost as leaving Amsterdam, going to Mongolia. It's the same thing, the same process, the same kind of decision making, same fears. <laughs> Mongolia is a country located between Russia and China. It is as big as France, Germany, Italy, and the UK combined. Mongolia is home to only 2.8 million citizens, 50% of which live in the capital city, Ulaanbaatar. The climate is extremely cold in Ulaanbaatar. It's known as the coldest capital on earth. One of the country's main problems is alcoholism. 80% of the men have drinking problems, which results in a high volume of violence and many broken families. I heard about Mongolia, it was in 95. I was uh, working in Amsterdam as a child psychologist for a child children protection board. It's like part of the Ministry of Justice and I really enjoyed it. By that time I attended a conference, a worship conference, and um, I heard Jackie Pullinger speak. Actually she wasn't speaking about Mongolia. But the subject of her message was like going with God, the heart of God for the lost world. And it so much touched me that I started praying again, God, what do you want me to do? And even the next morning, as I was cleaning the house, we were staying at my mom's and I was cleaning the house and I was vacuum cleaning. And I just sensed like God is pulling my heart. And I said, God, I don't know what, what are you trying to tell me? I feel like, would you want me in mission or would you want me to go to another place? And then I said, God, if, if you have a place for me, I really want to know. But I'm quite helpless if I don't know, you know. So if you have something, I sense that you have something, but could you please bring it in my mind right now? if it's like that. And then it was like a light went on, like I saw a neon light. I, I can't, people said, ask me, do, did you hear a voice or did you see it? I can't say I heard it with my ears or I saw it with my eyes, but it was even louder and more clear than that. Mongolia, it was so like inside of me. It was so, it was like neon. And I was so amazed, I just, I switched off the vacuum cleaner, I was like, what? Mongolia? I'm trained as a, as a psychologist, and I used to be 
still tend to be quite rational and I was like okay could it be like I picked this up somewhere and I'm just associating and so I said God I don't know what's happening it's, it's like am I going crazy or is it you speaking to me Mongolia where is it what's Mongolia you know where is it Asia or is it Africa <laughs> it's funny I had I had no clue about the country Hanukkah is now en route to the Henti province, a place where there are no foreigners. During the last five years, she's worked in the poorest district of Ulaanbaatar. <laughs> Hanukkah came about five years ago here, and she joined our team. She's a a brilliant lady full of life and uh, the desire to share this life and the joy she has with others. Haneke is a special woman. So she is open to new things. <laughs> when, when, also sometimes when it's a crazy idea, but when she has in her heart it is from God, mm. then she goes. <laughs> she is also brave. Yeah. So she, when she goes in the winter time, in, when it's dark yes, at home, yes. and she saw a drunken man lie on the street, and she know when I don't take him, he is dying, uh, dead Dying in the morning. Yeah. Then she stop, she goes, she wake him up, or yes, she do something. So I never did this because I'm really afraid of drunken men. <laughs> Yeah, there, there are moments maybe we have to, to uh, remind her, maybe a, you are a woman, just don't be... Call us up so Tom can come and help or something. Yeah, sometimes. She comes and she just smiles at the people, works with the people, helps the people, and the people open up. She's not just a project-orientated person, she's a relationship person, so she... She likes to hang around with the people, and the people can hang around with her. People will start living in her presence, because it's also the presence of God with her. A story my mom told me once. She, one out of seven, used to ask her mom sometimes, hey mom, which one do you love best? And then my grandmother said, I love that one most that needs me most right that time. And last time being in Henty, I, this came back to me because I saw these people. I thought, hey, I love the people in Ulaanbaatar. I love the people I've been close with, but they have other people here now, but then the people in Henty, you know, they are le looking for how to go on. So I'm not sure, I don't know if it means that God wants me there, but the question is there. Before Hanukkah goes to Untergang, she first wants to visit Beinedrag, 
In this little village lives a woman named Girlock. She begged Hanukkah to come and visit her. Six months ago, Hanukkah met Girolat when Girolat was visiting the city. During this meeting, Girolat became a believer. Her faith had an enormous influence on her and her family. It's really touching to hear what uh, happened. So she was there and say, hey, my husband, he became a believer and he was so like, oh, there's so much to talk about and so much changed in my life since you met with my wife. It's so beautiful to like hear that he said, I was drunk every day, you know, also his, his children confirmed it. And now my life changed so much. This month I drank one glass one time. I mean, being drunk, it, it ruins your life. Girolat and her husband became believers in a village where no one had even heard of Jesus. People from the village started to ask them questions they could not answer. That we are coming here, people were so happy, they called like the whole village. Mongolia used to be a Buddhist country. After 60 years of communist oppression, many people returned to Buddhism. Since the fall of communism in 1992, the country is open to many religions. In this little village of Bainadrak, no one had ever really heard about Jesus. So people here, they are so open and they don't have this kind of prejudices. Some, some people have, they think like, Jesus is a foreign religion, so I really try to explain him, no, it's not, it's a living God and he created all, you know, he's not the God of the Dutch or the Americans or particular group. When Jesus was living on this earth, he was living in the Middle East, you know, he was not European or Western. We prayed for sick people. First I asked pe sick people to show up and then we prayed together. And first I said, does anybody notice any change? And nobody said something. And then a few minutes later, I said, hey, Hanukkah, sorry, this guy, he feels something, he wants to come. And there was this man with crutches. And he said, I feel so much better all of a sudden. So he used to be normal, but for a few years he had an accident and then he walked along time with two crutches and then he could manage with one, but it was very heavy. And even sometimes he could put it aside, so that wasn't new. But he said today, and now I really feel it's so much uh, light, there was such a heaviness, it was so difficult.
They wanted us also to pray for the boy who has like a problem with his bones, so that's why he's walking difficult. But I said, okay, we have two other believers here, so they can just pray the same as I do, so we can pray together. I would like to stay here, spend more time with them, trying to help, but there are other places to go. It's time for Hanukkah to continue her journey. The people in Undergang, who were first to invite Hanukkah, are waiting there for her. From now on, everyone in this town must rely on Girolat and her husband to pray for them and answer their questions about Christianity. Yet, it was not long ago that Girolat's marriage was in turmoil and her husband battled a serious drinking problem. The question now is if this is too big of a responsibility for them. She is a person who communicates, she talks with everybody, but she is still, you know, part of her life is quite a mess still. And of course I couldn't say, don't tell anybody about Jesus because your life is not in order yet. I love you. I love you too. Bitte mein Gerte. Weiter. Ciao, Tore. Weiter, Kommissar. It will take at least a couple of months before Hanukkah is able to return to Meinadrag. She hopes that Girolat and her husband will overcome their problems and will be a help for the people in their village. And then... The long journey to Undergan continues, a place where she will be the only foreigner, a place that might be Hanukkah's home for a long time. I will make new friends, I get to know the Mongols, but even sometimes it's nice just to chat with some of the team or just like somebody from my place. So how would that feel? Would I not be lonely there if I there for a longer time? Things like that. This is uh, like Bira and his wife Ayuna, his daughter Aya, the Banza, the youngest boy. They have another daughter, but she doesn't live at home anymore. And this is uh, the friend. And um, Bira was deaf by at one ear, and he, they prayed for him, and he was healed. The eldest daughter, who is not here now, she was like epileptic. She was healed too, and the whole family, they became believers, and they have been really supporting us since then. So I'm very pleased to see them. They said, oh, Hanneke, so nice things are happening. Many people are coming. So we have a lot to talk the first morning in Untergan, 
Hanukkah realizes that there are a lot of people waiting to meet her, and that there is a lot of work to do. She will share her life with the people yes. there. And through this, that the people so see her, how she is, how she lives, how she handles things. She will be touchable no, for the people. Yeah. It's really important. Jesus, who is touchable, no? Jesus in her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this will change lives. Yeah. As woman, mm -hmm. to be alone there, so when somebody called you in the night, come to my house, my father is sick, he almost died, come to pray. Yeah, as woman alone to go, yeah, it can be dangerous. It's hard. The first thing Hanukkah does is visit the people she came to know the last time she was in Untergon. Uh, I would be so happy for her if she really could take care of her kids because she like gave one to the father but I don't think she's so peaceful about it but she just does things like that because she doesn't know what to do so I would be really happy if she has kind of a stable life if they have enough to eat if the kids can go to school uh, and she has a peace, you know. I, I seen her very happy sometimes that she said, oh, Jesus is really with me. And of course, sometimes you see her struggle and worry so much because she has quite a heavy burden, like being poor and having to take care of four children. Yeah. Yeah, I used to be very depressed, like my, they say like my heart will just be like falling. But now I'm getting up. You some, some. Oh, I used to just wish that I was dead. Emdermark we basic it you. Uh huh. Oto, emdrechusic beno. Yeah, now I want to live. As I got to know her, she was already living in this little hut. It still looks very simple, but it looks amazing compared to what we found her in, you know. There was nothing inside, it was just dirty and dark, nothing on the floor, nothing on the... just bare wood, very dirty. So um, we got her, like, material and we helped her to put the sand outside to protect it from wind coming in. And then we got her this thing for heating. And the, the men from church, they helped to fix the walls and put some nice material. So she really was very pleased and said, hey, can you come and look how it is? And if I see people just uh, starting to make it pretty and put some colors and put a little flower, I think it's a sign of life. Because seeing these things are really pleasing, of course. It helps me on moments that you think, oh, what am I here for? The, especially seeing like light in the eyes of people. And I think, yeah, that's just the life of God entering their lives. Seeing that, that's really the thing. Hanukkah is happy that she arrived in Untergon. She's finally able to meet the people she'll live with for a long time. But her heart is still with Girolad and the people of Baina Drag. I keep thinking about them. How are they doing? Is he okay with his drinking? You know, I think there are some more things to clear up and to help them. You see, you know? And then you come here and people are already waiting. And at one hand, I think, wow, what a blessing, you know, to be connected with so many people. And at the same time, it sometimes makes me feel like like you are one big breath and everybody's just ripping pieces of you. And I think, yeah, that's what I should allow because that's, I think, what Jesus did, just sharing his life with people. But sometimes you say sharing your life, you know, it's just a phrase. But if you really share your life, it costs really something, you know. It means what I give, it's not mine anymore. Hanukkah told her stories to her colleagues at Help International. They came to the conclusion 
that they really need to send somebody to Bindadrak to help the people there. The only question is, is there somebody available? Aber andererseits denke ich, unsere Ausrichtung sollte doch sein, dass wir immer Leute schicken können. Wenn wir so ausgerichtet sind, dass Leute nicht weg können, dann machen wir etwas falsch. Hanukkah receives a phone call from Tom. Bad news. Hmm. It is not going well with Gerolot and her family. And there is no one available ja. to go to Beinadrak. Ja. Könntest du andere Leute vorstellen, die da auf Uh -huh. We are training missionaries. If we can't send people, there is something difficult, of course. But that's, I think that's the tension that you are like right here in Henty also. We are building a lot of things. We are not ready yet. And at the same time, people are calling us from the, please come, please come and help us. And for me, it's such like, oh, please. Please. I see the people in Bainadrak as well, you know. That really hurts me because the people there who just became believers, I know. People are looking for them, for an example, and I know he's drinking, you know, they're fighting in the family, they can't do it. We can't expect them to be leaders. Sometimes it's like think before you start something, but some things you start without knowing. I didn't decide to plan to start something in Bainal. It just happens. But then you see the people, you think, who is to look going to take care of them, you know? You could start things everywhere, but you need the people to maintain it. And that takes time. So there's no easy solution. <laughs> no, it's an expensive solution. It's people's lives, you know, that's what we need. There are many poor people in Untergon who love to spend time with Hanukkah. Yeah, the, the girl, I saw them like a long time ago and as I saw her, I saw she was so dirty, you know, and they live in quite dirty circumstances. So by that time I said, Which, shall I just take her for a shower? I don't do that so much, but seeing her, I really wanted just to spoil her with a nice warm shower. And But that time they were like, no, no, no. But then she told me yesterday that since that time the girl kept talking about the fact that I would like to take her to a place where like hot water is running from the ceiling. But I think before going, I might, we might have to get to her like a shirt and so on, because it's no sense, you know, to come out of the shower and get back in those really dirty stuff. She has been bitten by a dog and she has like a physical handicap. So she can't go to school, she used to, uh, be laughed at a lot of children and can't study well. I just noticed walking in the shop with them that people of the, the villagers are talking loud, you know, in their presence. Oh, these poor people and what are they doing here? So I think imagine always being like that, having people talk about you right beside you and. So I think it's nice to have clean, nice clothes, a clean body, have a nice haircut, and just feel, can just make a different feel. She was very dirty, but also people really looked down on her, and she would not allow anybody to touch her. And so I thought, well, one time I want to really just have her have a good shower. And at first she was like, kind of, no, no, I can't do it. And she enjoyed it so much, you know. She was just laughing, starting singing. Now she's, and I mean, they were really in need of a shower. They were so black, the whole body. This is 
is an exception. But it's just nice to do something, something like that. I know in the past sometimes when you do it, it helps them to stay clean for a long time. Like the mom, she looked much worse in the past. And then one time we, we cleaned the house and I told her, helped her a bit. And since then she starts doing her hair or putting a little makeup. I think it's a good sign, you know, to give them back a bit of their self-worth. It's the easiest, actually, to buy things and to help also with practical and financial uh, projects. But at the other hand, I, we, I don't want people to rely on me. We don't want people to come to help only and, and not being able to do something for themselves. Sometimes you do it because sometimes it just will give them a good impulse. So we do things like that. But I prefer, prefer seeing people helping each other, and that's what they're starting to do now. Yeah. Oh, look at them, they're so nice and clean. See? Koi boss. Hanukkah decided to live together with three girls. She trains them to take care of people. They visit the needy, work in church, and teach children who have never learned how to read and write. If one day Hanukkah moves to another village, these girls could be ready to take her place. Monica heard that Girolat and her husband are in Untergon and that they are not doing very well. This is the, her younger son, so she is still in town, but she went somewhere, they don't know where, but she will come back in the evening probably, but we don't know. See, Mittich Ben, Boombetleet, eh? So I hope I can see her tomorrow. Maybe she worries because they had trouble and now she doesn't want to meet with me. But I hope to see her anyway. Then Hanukkah runs into Girolat's husband, Bimanda. He wasn't completely drunk, but he has been drinking a bit. And he told me also where his wife was. She was just, I think, first embarrassed, you know, because she knew, hey, actually, she wanted to get out of this kind of uh, things. But she also uh, told me, like, what's happening in her life. <laughs> I really hope, you know, and I pray that God is restoring them as a family and as a person. And I think that's the most important. You can't expect such a young believer with such a 
his stable life still to get up and take care of, of new believers. Hanukkah thinks a lot about the new believers in Beinadrach. Hoping that Girolat and her husband would take care of them, she realizes that it's going too fast. Aya, who is one of the girls Hanukkah has been training, frequently talks about Beinadrach. This makes Hanukkah decide to take Aya to Beinadrach and leave her there to help for a period of time. to Beinadruck, it's about like 160 kilometers, but it takes a bit of time because there are no paved roads, you just go um, on, in the sand, the steps. The people of Beinadrak need help. Girolat and her husband need support. The new believers have a lot of questions about the gospel, and there are a lot of sick people who ask for prayer and need to be visited. <laughs> The mother is not here, but this child was uh, by the father. He was drunk and then he took the child and threw it along the care. And since then, the child is really severely handicapped, it's like blind, lame. And the lady, they ask us to pray for the child. It's amazing, you know, the violence is such a big problem. Most of the time uh, related to alcohol, like 90%. Hanukkah realizes that she has to train more people like Aya, who will be capable to take over the work she's doing and can stay in a village like Beinadrak for a longer time. There are several villages where people are coming and say, please come to us and we don't have a church here and we don't know about Jesus, we want to know. 
So, for example, there is Binder. It's a small town close to Bijnadrak, just 40 kilometers from here. And we are planning to go there in June. Sometimes when I hear about places where people never heard about Jesus, it really touches my heart. So if people want to see me cry, maybe they have to tell me about these people, you know? Hanukkah is leaving by Nadrag. She leaves Aya behind to support Irolat, Bimandag, and the new believers in the village. Hanukkah will go back to Untergang, where there are a lot of people that need her support. There is still a lot of work to be done in Uttergaan, but Hanukkah is not sure how long she will stay there. She doesn't know if God will ask her to go again to another village, another province, or even another country. At one hand, I think, oh, my life is just a dream. I love it. And at the same time, I think, God, it's too expensive. But I guess it's not. But what is a moment, last days, when you think it's too expensive? You know, I, I never know where I'm going. I really made a decision and I said, I really... No, I, I gave my life to Jesus, you know, and I said, you can bring me wherever you want. But of course, sometimes it's really frightening because I don't know where I will be in a few months. And I'm really a relationship person, you know, and for me saying goodbye is really hard. Sometimes it, when I'm at one place a longer time, it's different, you know, you feel like you settle down. But lately I really sense how God is stirring my heart. I see this harvest, you know, I see these people and I know I just live w once and I wouldn't like to stand for God later and say, hey, I knew, but I didn't want to leave my comfort zone, but of course, sometimes I think it cost me everything. I never regretted going to Mongolia and I never regretted living this life style. But one thing I said, God, you didn't tell me that it would change my whole heart. I felt suddenly I can't go back, you know. It's not, I have been living like that for a few years and I cannot just, okay, now it's enough, I go back. I felt like I can't go back anymore because it changed me so deep within that I wouldn't fit in. It's not, I, I'm not saying I can't go back to Holland. It's more, I can't, I'm not the one I used to be. And, I, and that was kind of a shock for me. I said, God, you ruined me, you know. <laughs> You ruined me. I'm not the same anymore. It just all went so deep and it changed me so deep, deeply that there's nothing I can do about it, you know? I can only say, just follow 
God, don't be afraid. Just give everything to God, because you know when He's, He has called you, you know it, and you know it, and you know it. And there are so many things that keep pulling you back, and I've been there. But I can just say that I thank God every day that He helped me just to give it all up and to say, yes, God, I just go in your way and I never, ever regret it. Dance and so, 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 so,